Scythe is a game of deep and varied strategy that takes multiple plays to get one's head around. One of the shortcuts you can take with games like this is learning from one of the best players in the world. Today, we are fortunate to have Fomoff as our guest. He's one of the highest ranked players in the Scythe community. Get out your notepad and sharpen your pencil as we're going to dive in and learn how to play this game better here on Legendary Tactics. All right, so welcome, Fomoff, one of the one of the uh, resident experts of Scythe, <laughs> uh, the board game. I'm so excited to speak with you and to and to go in depth a little bit on on how to play Scythe better because it's such a great game, but there's a lot to it. And so, uh, tell tell us a little bit about your experience with the game so far, what tournaments and you know just plays and that sort of thing. A little bit about your your uh, street cred there. Thanks. Thanks for the welcome, NATO. Uh, I got into Scythe probably between two and a half and three years ago now. A friend of mine brought it to my house, the physical version, and I loved it. Scythe has a very, in my mind, unusual combination of engine building um, with action selection, but combined with area denial. And the map itself is absolutely beautiful. And the area control and area denial that's involved in the game, in from in my experience, really put it far and away um, ahead of every game I'd ever played, and I instantly fell in love with it. There was a I, I bought it probably the next day it shipped to me. There was a coupon in it to get the digital version for thirty percent off. I couldn't wait to get together with my friends again before I played it again. Uh, I bought the digital version and I never looked back. Uh, I was probably played for about six months to a year when I decided to start recording games. Around that time, there's a Scythe Discord that you can find if you search online. There's a um, pretty vibrant community that started hosting tournaments. Um, the first one was on Tabletop Simulator. They went on to host multiple tournaments. I, I work on the team now that hosts the tournaments. Uh, they played mostly on the digital edition now. I've managed to win two of the tournaments. Oh, uh, there are about seven to nine total, I think, that have taken place. I've probably participated in about seven of those. And my ELO on the digital edition fluctuates, but I'm, I'm typically considered a pretty high ELO player. Um, for those of you who don't know, that's, that's basically just the online ranking system. And I've, I've been ranked as high as fourth in the world on that. And I've probably put, put close to now 200 videos online between strategy tutorials and gameplay. And for the past basically now two years, I've had my finger on the pulse of what's considered meta or optimal scythe play according to the sort of hive mind that is the online scythe community, yeah. which is, as you probably know with, uh, with board games, uh, a board game progresses to a certain point when people play it at home, but you have lots of insular pockets. When the game moves online, there's the opportunity for people all over the world to share strategies and it ratchets it up, ratchets it up the learning curve and really the level of advanced play. And that's a community I've been a part of for and really helped develop for quite a while now. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, we'll put a we'll put a link to the uh, Discord in in the description of this video so people can find it easily because I'm sure now if they plug in are they going to be overwhelmed or is it is it going to be uh, is it good for anyone at any level to I, th I think anyone can can join and it's it's a it's a welcoming friendly community. Um, you can be involved in it however much or however little you want. You can read whatever you want and and just leave it alone if you, if you want. I think that's one of the great things about Discord in general. I've also got a, a Discord server myself that functions as a, a, a discussion platform and a, a library to easily access my videos as well. So people could check that out. Well, that's great. All right. Well, uh, let's get into it. So today's guide is going to be more, more of a general guide, I would say, to uh, aimed at players who are uh, who've played the game and know the game a, you know, a little bit, but maybe they they just want to raise their level of play. They, they want to move it to a more uh, higher level of play. Um, so we're, we're not going to explain the basics or anything of the rules or anything. We're going to assume that people know those and just dive into the, uh, the strategy. So, so first of all, let's, let's look at the, the big picture and the paths to victory. 
And there, in, inside, there are many possible paths to victory, but are there any that you see as being preferable, preferable, more reliable, easier, in your opinion? On, on just a fundamentally simple level, I think you can think of all the paths to victory as fitting into two different categories. And that is what I would call race strategies and stall strategies. And what, the, what those mean, basically, a race strategy is a strategy where I'm trying to end the game quickly. And I'm trying to be the first one to six stars and have the most area control, the most territories um, under my control. And in the game, while people are still setting up and beginning to run their engines. And with a race strategy, those are the strongest strategies inside and those are the most reliable. And certain combinations of player mat and faction can race the game at different speeds. Some do it better than others. And that gives way to the second category of strategies, which I call st stall strategies. Sometimes you'll get a combination and from experience, you'll know I can't end the game very quickly with this particular combination. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna stall the game, which means I'm gonna get my point value as high as I can, as quick as I can, so that if another player ends the game, racing the game, I win. And if they can tell I'm winning, they can't in the game <laughs> until I finally get a chance to place my sixth star. So that's pretty abstract. To make yeah. it a little bit more concrete with a race strategy, most of your points are going to come from your stars and your territories. You may or may not have a lot of coins. Um, your target to end the game is about 14 to 17 turns for a race strategy. I've ended a game in as little as 10 turns before, but that's rare. Um, most combinations, 14 to 17 is pretty reasonable for a race strategy. You're going to spread late. You spread out your units, your character, your mechs, your workers um, late in your strategy, like most strategies, but it's going to be pretty early in the game. And you're hoping to end um, before other players can um, really get out on the board because territories tend to be the biggest source of points inside. Yeah. A lot of people think it's coins, but it's not. It's territories. Um, whereas on the stall side of things, um, your points are going to come from trying to get territories earlier while not sacrificing your engine, getting a lot of coins, and maybe popularity. And your target for ending the game, we said 14 to 17 for a race strategy. You're looking at 18 to 20, maybe upwards of 22 for a stall strategy. You get beyond that and someone else is going to end the game and win the game. So yeah. I, think, I think that is a useful framework for newer players to think of as they play a combination They can sit down and play a combination they've never played before and say, is this a race combination or a stall combination or maybe both? I don't know. Let me play it and see what it feels like and then come away and draw their own conclusion about that was a slower combination. Next time I play it, I'm going to focus on coins and popularity and getting um, eight workers and spreading out territories and having a vibrant engine or that was really fast. That game only took an hour and every, all my friends were like, what did you do? That's a race strategy. And I'm going to do that again the next time I get the combination. So I think those are two really helpful categories to think about strategies as falling into. Oh, that's great. Okay. So if we're looking um, at the early game, um, whether, you know, maybe it may depend on the strategy or, or maybe not, but is there, is there a top priority? Is there a kind of development path that generally makes sense um, in, in the early game? Yeah, I think the most important thing for players to do when they start the game is to, to plan out what stars they're going to get. Um, because any sort of path to victory is sort of paved through your stars. You don't want to start one star and then give, half, give up halfway through and start another star. Because whether you're stalling or racing the game, Scythe is ultimately... A game where you have a limited amount of turns any any sort of board game you play there's some sort of abstract system of value that lies at its base maybe it's the currency maybe it's it could be anything but inside like a lot of games it's turns and it's an indeterminate number of turns so you want to be efficient and you want to be quick so it helps to plan your stars if you don't mind i i just like to run down and give a quick sort of star priority, what I consider sure. to be the best Absolutely. stars. That'd be great. Yeah. So the, the first one I always list that might throw people for a bit of a loop is the worker star. And there are a few reasons for this. You're, you're going to need at least five workers to run your engine anyway. 
a lot of times the best engine runs off of eight workers and eight workers is just one more turn ahead of five workers. And once you get those workers that synergizes with being able to spread out the over the board and take territory, as I mentioned earlier, territory is really your biggest source of points inside. So mm -hmm. I'm of the opinion that in 95% of the games you play or maybe higher, you should get the worker star, which is why I list it first. Um, the second star I would list is the enlist star. And this is a star that many people would list first because enlists are just so strong. Any of your viewers who don't already know this, you should go for all four enlists in almost every game because enlists, enlists are just completely overpowered. So <laughs> for I'm sure your viewers are who are interested in scythe kind of understand how they work. Yeah. You, uh, you do what's called a bottom row action and you get a certain benefit. Well, it also works this way if your neighbor gets the benefit does it the bottom reaction you get the benefit as well and you have in most games if it's not a two-player game you have two neighbors so the coin enlist i get a coin every time a neighbor or myself makes a mech well that doesn't seem like a big deal at first blush i didn't think it was when i started side but if i get that coin enlist early and i get four coins from one neighbor for four mechs four coins from the other neighbor and four coins off my mech my mechs that's 12 coins and a typical rush strategy might end the game with anywhere from 50 to 60 points. So one bottom row action, one enlist could end up being 20% of your entire score in a game aside, which is just incredible. Yeah. Um, the other one that's really huge is the combat card enlist. Um, you can pick up upwards of 10, 11, 12 combat cards from enlist. And if you were going to bolster that many combat cards, it would take at least, it would take something like six turns. You'd have to upgrade the combat card and then bolster repeatedly. So being able to get six turns worth of combat cards off one bottom row action is just incredible. And if you're going to get two, you might as well get four because yeah. that's going to help. Yeah. I so guarantee you that beginner players undervalue enlist. I guarantee mm -hmm. that because they're just going for their mechs. They're trying to, you know, they're trying to you know, they're doing all like, they're not paying attention to that particular, uh, that benefit, but yes. And lists are huge. Yeah. 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 Great. And, uh, but speaking of, uh, of, uh, of mechs, um, what, what, uh, what do you say about the, them? How do they fit into this? Yeah. So the mech star is actually the star I, I, I list third and it's, uh, they're basically good for two different things. And that is claiming territory by either occupying the territory themselves or spreading a worker to that territory and to get you your combats. And the reason is that is so important is because the next two stars are combats and objective. And the reason they, they land as high as they do is how few turns they take. You can get both combats and an objective in one turn. That's three stars. It's half your stars to six. So why wouldn't you do that every single game? Well, if you're racing the game, you do. If you can get yeah. your objective and you can get your two combats, um, you get them. But yeah. you need your you need mechs to do that, which means you're probably going to get that mech star too. So for that reason, combats and objectives come in as number four and number five. Okay, excellent. And then after that, um, what would you what would you rank after uh, number five there? Yeah, I'd say I'd say power. And that's going to be mat dependent. Mm. Um, power synergizes really nicely with, um, with mechs and combats. You got to be careful with that power star because sometimes it can cause you to pass up opportunities for good combats and good board control because you're like, oh, I'm at 13 power. I'm going to get the power star next turn. I don't want to attack oh, because yes. I want to get that power star. So be careful and also be mindful that it's only good on certain boards. So for instance, the mechanical board bolster is over deploy so you can get power while you're getting your mechs so that can be a really good board to go for the power star same thing with the agricultural board where bolster is over enlist so if bolster is over a bottom row action you're going to be doing anyway like usually deploy and enlist uh, that can be a mat that's good to go for the power star you would completely ignore the power star if you had um, for instance the militant board where it's over upgrade the innovative board where it's over um, I want to say build and the industrial board where bolster is also over upgrade. You would just ignore yeah. the power star completely with those mats. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And then, uh, and then is there anything after that? Yeah. The next three in this order would be build upgrade and popularity mm-hmm. and build is basically a poor man's enlist. It mm. gives you a benefit for doing the top row action associated with it. So a monument gives you a, uh, a popularity when you do the top row action associated with it, a power for the armory, the mine yes. just triggers when you move. Um, but you don't get it for your neighbors. So build is a poor man's enlist. And yeah. there's this challenge with build is that you already have to have a worker there before you build. So you have to move the worker there yeah. and then you have to build, which adds turns. So when you see building, it usually happens with a board like industrial that puts the movement action over the build. So you can knock those two out at once. Um, Another downside to building is if your neighbors are going for enlist and they get the popularity enlist, they could actually be getting more popularity than you off your building. <laughs> oh, no way. So you got to be careful. You got to be careful about building because sometimes yeah. you help your neighbors more than you help yourself. Wow. Um, the next two upgrade and popularity are kind of at the bottom for obvious reasons. Upgrade is the only bottom row action that takes six instead of four. Yeah. Um, mechs buildings, enlist, they're all four. Upgrade is six. So it just takes a long time. And with popularity, 13 popularity is tier three. You need another five to get to 18. And popularity is not easy to score in this game. You basically never want to go for popularity unless it just happens. Like you get a factory card with Polonia that gives you two pop. And then you get that encounter that gives you four popularity. So you picked up six on one turn, that kind of thing. Yeah. It can happen but you almost never like plan to go for it. Yeah. Um, upgrade when it happens is usually with a map that kind of like build move is over upgrade and you're picking up encounters that just happen to keep gifting you oil. Sometimes the upgrade will start star will happen when you do that. But that that's what I would say is the, my priority of stars. And I think, that's the most helpful starting point of planning out your strategy is to realize that most successful games, you're going to get kind of that, that holy stick stars. You're going to get the worker star, the enlist star, the mech star, two combats and an objective. Yeah. And the others can situationally be good, but those six kind of form the core of most successful games. Hmm. Okay. Um, now just uh, talking about balance. Now I know um, you wanted to kind of take the lead on this one, uh, I think with uh, how, how you wanted to handle that uh, question. Yeah. Scythe, as, as you know, is an asymmetric game. So it's not like a game like chess or um, spades or a, a number of games. Azula, I think I played recently for the first time. Um, Azul, I'm sorry, um, It's where it's a completely symmetrical game. And that's one of the beauties of Scythe. But it does lead to some sort of balance issues. I don't think you'd notice them so much on beginner levels. But the more you play Scythe, the more people tend to find that Rusfian and Crimea tend to uh, pull ahead of the other factions. Um, Relentless, where Rusfian can just do the same thing over and over again, is so strong and coercion where Crimea can use a combat card for a resource is right behind it. Cause it's functionally like having an optional upgrade on every column at the wow. start. And that's just, that's incredibly strong. They also, I think Crimea has the best starting um, space in the game where they have a worker on a farm and a worker on the village already ready to go. Yeah. A lot of factions have to move to a village. So that saves a turn. And once they get their workers in a mech, they have easy access with a speed mech to food and metal just right out of the gate. Yeah. And that makes that's a lot of why Crimea is strong. They can they can be a strong faction even not using coercion, not using their faction ability. Whereas Rusviet also has, they start on metal and a village, but they have two farms just right across the river from them. So using Relentless can hammer out a quick river walk mech and they can be on the farm um, lickety split. So huh. the, you've got the two strongest um, faction abilities in the game combined with the two best starting positions in the game causes Rusfian and Crimea to be very successful and typically are considered the two strongest factions. Hmm. I wonder if they uh, had set it up for a random setup or whether that would be desirable, you know, to mix up the starting uh, starting positions uh, from yeah. the outset. 
there's a there's a modular board that does that. Yeah. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with it because it's not it's not a it's not available online where the vast yeah. majority of my play has been. Yeah. Well, maybe something where it would, you know, unbalance the game too, because you'd end up with uh, squares that made no sense at all, or, you know what I mean? Or just very yeah. difficult to get to where you need to be. So that's good. Could make it worse, not better. Yeah, exactly. Maybe, maybe, maybe a solution they'd already thought of and, you know, just did, it just didn't work. So in the mid game, moving on to the mid game, like how do you juggle all the variables involved with hitting all the different potential goals that, you know, you got to get to the factory, you got to manage your territory, uh, you know, reaching all the primary, uh, you know, objectives of getting those stars and fending off your opponents where you're beginning to run into each other. Um, you know, you want to be able to end the game on your terms. So how do you manage that uh, in that mid game section? I would talk about two different mistakes that I see newer players making. And so my advice to sort of counter that would be don't make these two mistakes, do the opposite, right? Yeah. Um, as a quick aside, going to the factory is some early is good with some factions and, and not as good with some other factions. And we can talk about that in a minute. But what I would say the two mistakes I see is newer players looking at their mat and I see people give this advice people who maybe have 10 to 20 plays give playthroughs give this advice all the time. And they say, look at your mat, see what gives the most coins and do those actions. And that's just wrong. Huh. It's wrong. Wow. Yeah. If you are in a stall game, the answer is maybe if you were trying to stall out the game, then sure. Um, maybe you build, maybe you upgrade um, with the engineering board, maybe. But most of the time, if the, your best strategy to race the game, the coins are not what matters because the coin's not your biggest source of points. Remember, it's territories and stars. Um, building is slow. Just because it gives you three coins for a building doesn't mean that's a great strategy. Upgrades are slow. The industrial board gives three coins for upgrades. I almost never upgrade with the industrial board at all unless one's handed to me in an encounter. So don't let the coins distract you. There's no better example than this in the innovative board which is hands down the strongest board in the game of scythe. Um, move is over in list and produces over deploy is what makes it so strong yeah. um, because you have to produce to get your workers. Well, if produces over deploy, you're also getting your mechs and you got to move to spread out and to get combats. It's over also over in list. So your best top row actions are over your best bottom yeah. row actions. You may never have to actually bolster and maybe you just trade a couple times on the innovative board um it's it's incredibly strong but players look at it and they say okay i get three coins for upgrading so i should upgrade a lot no i get i think it's two coins for building i should build with the innovative board no there are people who say the innovative board is bad because you just get one coin for deploy and you get no coins for enlist but it doesn't matter because the board is so fast and can end the game so quickly, you can have 10 territories and six stars and everyone else is still in their base. That's, oh, wow. that's how good it is. So don't get distracted by coins The focus on your path to six stars and your path to victory. The coins are a secondary consideration. The coins will make a board stronger, but they don't make a strategy stronger. Yeah. So but, yeah, no, there's, there's one more that I want to mention. And some players will hear this and say, well, yes, of course, but I can't tell you how many people that I see who don't put enough workers on a particular spot to make enough resources for the bottom row action. So the patriotic board produces over in list. I can't tell you how many times I've seen beginner players put one worker or two workers on a farm instead of the full three. Mm -hmm. So in general, distribute your workers to match your bottom row action costs. And when you look at a board, the first question that you should ask yourself when it comes to setting up an engine is, do I do five or eight workers? As your viewers may be familiar with, five is the greatest number of workers you can have before you start paying popularity. And if you're going to get more than five, you might as well just have eight um, because eight gives you the star. Um, typically five you go for if you're in a trying to get tier two or tier three in a race strategy and eight is generally better than um at 
running an engine just because you get more resources, even though you're paying popularity. Um, so make sure when you allocate those workers that you're putting enough workers on there for at least one bottom row action. Sometimes it can be helpful to overproduce resources. So for instance, on the patriotic board, if I'm Rusviet and I put seven or of my workers on food and I produce twice, well, now I've got enough food for the other two enlists I haven't done yet. I can move off food and put them on something like metal produce metal and keep doing enlists because I've produced extra food. So always be sure to put enough workers on the spot to do at least one bottom row action. And don't be afraid to do at least more, even, even more than that. It's a, it's a basic tip that I think newer players really up their game and reduce the number of turns they have to take significantly by, by doing that. Yeah. So, uh, so once again, about, uh, about conflict and how you, how you see that fitting into uh, the game and, and what's its role? So a lot of people complain that Scythe is essentially a game of solitaire where everyone's doing their own thing around the table. And that's true if everyone's doing their own thing around the table, mm. but that's not the way to win. We already mentioned very briefly that sort of your six, your, your holy six stars are going to include two combats and that your best strategy is going to involve a lot of territory. So if you're moving out to take territory, you're going to find people are contesting you for that territory. Um, so it's important to be able to engage in combat to win the territory, but also to get those stars. So stars are the first reason. Um, stars and territories are the first reason you would have conflict in the game of side. And the reason that people who initiate conflict will win in the game of side over people who just play solitaire most of the time. The second reason is disruption. So what you will find as you play side is certain combinations have better economies than other combinations. Rust Fiat Patriotic has a tremendous economy. It gets a lot of coins, it gets a lot of power, it gets its max and enlists very well. Nordic Industrial has a terrible economy, but Nordic Industrial can be a very strong combination because it can be very disruptive. It can get to the board, middle of the board quickly and get a factory card, hammer out those mechs and those workers very quickly because produce is over deploy, use a bottom row action factory card to make up for that bad economy and find itself very early in the game, just having to factory card and move factory card and move for the rest of the game. Wow. And at that point, you're in a position to get your combats, to get territory spread, get way ahead of points. And even if you're low on power, by repeatedly attacking people, eventually you're going to win. So you can do that to disrupt their economy as while you're spreading out and taking points. So if you play a combination and you try to run an economy game and you say, well, this is just terrible. I can't make this work. Think about how you can be disruptive with a combination and, and get out on the board, get a factory card and uh, that has a bottom row action on it. Because typically if you're going for those six stars, you need the two combats, the objective, the worker star, and then you need two bottom row action stars. Mechs are almost going to be one, and then your factory card can give you the other if your combination has a terrible economy. So being disruptive is, is a great equalizer inside between sure. combinations that have good economies and combinations that without being disruptive just can't compete. Yeah, yeah. Um, any other considerations about uh, with regard to combat? Yeah, I think it's really important to uh, to bluff combat. I think newer players tend to go all or nothing. Um, 12 is the magic number to win a 1v1. Uh, one is what you throw or a two card if you're just looking to cycle cards or get another combat card. Um, look for different ways to get combats by bluffing. It might mean a Saxony that you bring three units and attack with three units, but then just throw a four card. So someone yeah. who thinks I can't win this fight throws off and loses and there you just got a cheap combat, which can be yeah. huge to Saxony. Um, similarly, look to call a bluff now and again. One thing I like to think about is, um, and, and we did a, a Saxony tutorial on my channel the other day and just kind of with me and another Scythe player who's, who's quite good, um, just back and forth, he used the word tax. 
sometimes combat is a tax on the other player. So yeah. I might go in and I'll throw seven. And I don't throw seven because I think seven's going to win. I throw seven because I want to drain at least eight off that other player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I know that's going to put me in a, in a good position. Take the example of Nordic that starts with four power and one combat card. If I attack them and I throw four, that means they've either got to use all their power and their card yeah. to win, yeah. or they've got to use their card and it has to be a five card to win. So I, I either got to combat for four. I mean, their, their limit is nine, right? They can play up to nine. So if I throw four, I can't guarantee that I win, but what I can guarantee is they have to either spend all their power or their card or both to win. And then I can come back and get cheap combat subsequently. So it's important to bluff. It's yes. also important to think of spending as a tax. Not, not every loss is bad. Sometimes yeah. throwing a medium amount of power in combat cards, even if you lost, can be a good thing because it forced your opponent to put themselves in a worse position than it forced you yes. into. We've all made that mistake of the first time we played side, let's go all in on a battle. And then everyone else moves in because you've spent all your, your, your power and combat cards. You're totally vulnerable. So yeah. Just get mopped up. Yes, absolutely. So um, shifting to uh, resource management, how do you view that in the game? I mean, I love how Scythe handles the resources and, and in general, but you got to be like a lot of these type of games, you have to be efficient. It's the name of the game is efficiency. So how do you make sure that you're not wasting any actions and you have all your bases covered at the same time? Yeah, with, uh, with resource management, I first point back to our previous discussion about lining workers up on hexes in such a way that you are getting enough resources or more resources than you need for the bottom row actions. So that's the first thing to think about. The second thing to think about is how you're going to protect those resources because there's nothing that speeds up an opponent's game and slows down yours like getting resources stolen. So you have to have an idea, say you're Albion, well, where do I want to produce my resources? If I move out to that mountain tunnel and then Saxony hits me and uses disarm and I just lost all my metal, well, that sets me back and helps them. Yes. So I might want to make sure I'm producing on the mountain next to my base and staying on my back line. So it's important how many resources you're producing. It's also important where you're producing and where you, that you're producing in a place that you can defend them. Yes. Um, one of the points I'm going to make about this is Scythe is a game that rewards two things. It rewards improvisation that happens in the mid and late game. And it also re rewards having a plan. Some people say, oh, I don't want to have a predetermined strategy. If you're going to be really successful at Scythe, you need to come in with one, a predetermined strategy, and two, the ability to pivot and improvise as the game goes along. Yeah. Having no strategy makes for a player that doesn't succeed. Having a solid strategy makes for a good player. Having a solid strategy and being able to improvise makes for a great player. So when you say, how do you manage resources? Well, you do the, you do the things we talked about, but also recognize that you have to know, well, I'm gonna get one upgrade on the patriotic board and the max costs three after that upgrade. So I'm gonna need three times four is 12 total metal. And I'm gonna get those with two eight worker produces that I'm gonna do in turn seven and turn nine. Like you need to know that yes. going into it. You're probably not gonna get it on the fly, but you also need to be aware that your sequence needs to protect those resources. And then that sequence, you need to be able to have some flexibility. So if somebody attacks you, you're prepared to defend. If you get an opportunity to go engage in combat and get an easy combat, you can depart from the engine long enough to do that and then go back to the engine. So how do you manage resources inside? Have a sequence, have a plan, and then through experience, learn how to throw the plan in the trash and do something else. <laughs> yeah. Do you find the game demand almost demands a pivot in most, most games? Um, because in, uh, in a classic Euro, you have that moment between when you have to decide to give up on engine building and switch to gaining victory points, right? There's always that, that balancing point. Is there something similar inside? Yeah. It's, it's somewhat faction dependent though. So Rusvian and Crimea are well known for being able to end the game in anywhere from 12 to 15 turns reliably with just about any combination they could have. Now, not all of them will get a ton of points 
doing it, but they're kind of self-sustaining. You can get to six stars with an objective two combats and they can just kind of churn out those bottom row actions predictably. Yeah. Polania, Saxony, and those are the big ones that are great examples of factions that can't reliably do that. Saxony is the one faction that I almost never enlist with, for example. And Polania is the one faction where I almost never actually try to run an economy because they have meander and they can run their economy off of encounters. So my priority with Polania a lot of times is to get to the fact, have a sequence in mind to get to the factory in something like seven to nine turns and hope that what I get off the encounter speeds it up to five to seven, five to six turns and then bop around to encounters while I'm grabbing content combats and hopefully getting bottom row actions off my factory card and essentially play the game that the game gives me if the yeah. game starts giving me lots of wood i build buildings and pay popularity to place buildings if the game gives me enlists i get really excited because i got enlists <laughs> um but polani is about getting board presence getting that factory card and letting the game come to you so you might know going into Polania, what your first six to eight turns are going to be. But after that, you have no idea. Saxony is similar. You might know six or eight turns in, but after that, it's all movement and improvisation. Whereas Rusty and Crimea are more solved is kind of a bad word, but they have more set strategies that people follow for the most part that yeah. extend longer into the mid and even the late game. Wow. All right. Yeah. Uh, cool. Five versus eight workers. With Rustfeed and Crimea, I almost always go eight workers. Because when you have a vibrant economy with a faction that is self-sustaining the way the Crimea and Rusty economies are, what I mean by self-sustaining is they can make a lot of workers, they can put them on metal and, and food and either toggle back between something like produce, deploy, trade, enlist, produce, deploy, trade, enlist with the industrial board. Um, they can do something like that, or if it's something like the agricultural board where produce is overbilled, they can get eight workers, and then Crimea can produce enough resources in one turn to span like with one upgrade on the agricultural board, the remaining enlists and the remaining deploys. So I, I prefer eight, and I think the meta lends itself to eight definitely with Rustfeed and Crimea. With Polania, we talked about how you kind of let the game come to you. I think eight workers is also typically the way to go because with those, with the combinations like Saxony and Polania, where you're letting the game come to you, whether it's encounters or combats, the quicker you get to eight workers, the more lucrative those movement actions you're taking, whether it's combats or encounters. If you're dropping workers along the way and clogging up the board for your opponents, it's that many more points. The only times where I see five worker strategies still be viable, to be perfectly honest with you, is some mechless Nordic strategies use five workers. Um, those are so vulnerable, though, to players who know how to be disruptive. I've yeah. seen some Albion combinations use five workers. But if you're not using eight workers in a combination, it's worth sitting down and asking yourself why. Because yeah. players get worried about spending popularity but most successful strategies inside these days end in tier one popularity with a lot of territories oh really so popularity don't think of popularity as something you have to be in tier two or tier three to compete think of popularity as a currency that you spend yeah. on encounters and use for productive resources oh that's Excuse really me, productive produces yes popularity Popularity is a currency, first and foremost, if you're going to be in tier one anyway. Yeah, because it, it just feels when you spend popularity, you're setting yourself back on the victory point uh, side of things because you're you're losing out on a, on a multiple. You know, it could be, you know, uh, it feels like it's more maybe more costly than it actually ends up being. That's what kind of what you're saying. Yeah. So efficient strategies inside don't have a whole lot of leftover resources most of the time. So it can happen, but let's put that off the table for a second. So going from tier one to tier two means a star goes from being worth three to four. So that's a 33% increase and a territory goes from two to three. That's a 50% increase. Yeah. So that's not insignificant, but if I can end the game three turns sooner, that's better 
And the reason that's better is your first five, six, seven, eight turns inside, you could be sitting on 20 points after eight or nine turns inside, and you could be sitting on 70 points after 15. Your later turns, I, I've seen the turns, the last turn of the game swing 30 points. <laughs> if you count the points I get and the points my the guy I pushed to second place loses, yeah. you can have a 30 point turn. So at the end of the game, turns are so much more valuable. So if I have 10 territories and I go from tier one to tier two, I gain 10 coins. Mm. But if I can end the game two turns sooner and score that big 20 point turn and keep my opponent from getting that 20 point turn, that's so much better. Yeah. And going from tier one to tier two with stars is six coins. Yeah. It's six points. Yeah. So Tier one, tier two, and two, tier three become better the longer the game goes on. But if you can end the game quickly in tier one, you're almost always better off doing that than dragging the game out and hoping that you'll be in position to win it in a higher tier popularity later. If you can get it on your way, if people are going to leave mechs out and let you attack them and not lose popularity and you can get it, great. But don't lock yourself into it. Feel free to spend it as a currency to speed up your game. That's a really valuable insight. That's great. Um, so just look at the at the map board. Uh, you mentioned how great the map board is. And it's really interesting, especially when I first came across the game. It's just trying to get across the rivers was you know, your just that initial setup. But aside from you know crossing the rivers and 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 getting into the, the the rest of the board, are there any considerations about the map terrain or the way the map is designed that factors into your strategy? And specifically, you could also maybe talk a little bit about uh, encounters and maybe uh, uh, which option might uh, jump out. Because that's I, I see the encounters as being part of the map board, really. Uh, they're yeah. a map feature. So if, if you don't mind, I'll just talk about each faction really quickly and sure. talk about a few spots on the board that are significant to it. And let's start with Saxony. And the short answer is maybe the obvious answer and it's the mountains and the tunnels because of underpass a lot of people don't know this but underpass can not only go from tunnels to occupied mountains and occupied mountains to tunnels but it can go from an occupied mountain to an occupied mountain so that's that's in the rule book people wow. um a, a, lot, a lot of people know that but it's one that it's easy to miss i missed it for a long time so i'm going to get that out of there out of the way mountains and tunnels because of underpass and disarm so being able to control those areas of the board is incredibly valuable, leaving workers on the tunnels themselves to force your opponents to stop on those tunnels is valuable. Um, a very valuable spot for Saxony is the mountain that's right next to the factory. Because if your character is on your home base mountain, your character can move from that home base mountain to the factory in one turn by moving one mech either to the village in the forest tunnel, one space, two space with underpass and speed, two spaces to that mountain next to the factory, and then your character can move straight to that mountain next to the factory and then to the factory. So being clever with underpass and, and things like that can get you a lot of advantage. And there are a lot of strategic ways to use underpass and controlling the tunnels with disarm is extremely powerful with Saxony. So that's what yeah. you look for with Saxony. With Polonia, um, Saxony's biggest vulnerability, Saxony doesn't have a particularly vulnerable base. Um, the biggest thing that can happen with Saxony is if you go to five, five stars and you are not winning the game, everyone can just start attacking you and forcing you to lose the game Yeah, and go home. And once <laughs> they cover those tunnels, suddenly you can't come back and take the tunnels because you take a combat and lose the game. Yeah. Um, so your tunnels can betray you as Saxony. That's your biggest vulnerability spatial wise. With Polania, um, Polania has got the advantage of being having that village to be two an encounter to be two spaces away from the factory, and having a lake next to the home base that they can submerge out of. Mm -hmm. So the quick path to the factory, and that lake are perhaps the biggest areas for Polania. Um, as far as vulnerability, Saxony can invade their forest, and Crimea that if they're on that farm tunnel can actually use their river walk to invade Polania's base as well. So Polania can invade every base and can be invaded by every faction. Oh, wow. um, 
Albion's just kind of vulnerable everywhere. They've got legs all <laughs> over themselves. If Pilate is in the game and you're Albion, you're in for a world of hurt. Yeah. Um, the strength of Albion territory wise is once you get somebody on that, um, once you get say a flag and a worker on that village and you, you can essentially form, you know, like, like the 300 where they just kind of all amassed in a narrow channel. You can do that with Albion. There's really only one way into your base. If you're not a lake faction, yeah. and you can force a Saxony to have to come through three different mechs and kind of gobble up territory between the hexes and the flags while keeping a very, very strong, very concentrated force. Yeah. Nordic, um, like Polania, has that quick little two hop from that mountain to the factory. So getting the seaworthy mech and the speed mech, like Polania, gets speed and submerge and gets you to the factory pretty quickly. Um, the other place to note, at, with every game with Nordic, you have to decide which village you're going to use, um, which can be challenging. If Albion's in the game, if Rough Sweet's in the game, if both. You can use the village tunnel in some strats and even the village encounter near uh, Crimea and Saxony in some strategies. But you got to think about what village you're going to use and how when you're going to get to the factory as Nordic. Um, Rustviet, it's because of township, it's a village next to your base. Because of enlists, it's the farms to the north of your base. Your biggest vulnerability as Rustviet is the lake to your south. Yeah. And you got to watch for a clever Polania to submerge into that early. A turn five factory Polania is terrifying with most <laughs> Rustviet mats because yeah. you know with that factory card, they can hit your base the very next turn. Yes. So, oh, wow. And then that just leaves Tagawa. Tagawa, you got to protect stuff with traps because you've got that, that tunnel right next to your territory. And there's that mountain right next to your territory. So Saxony can actually take one mech to that village tunnel and then bump workers off that mountain. And then they could take another mech from their home base mountain to that mountain and then hit <laughs> any hex in your territory for a combat or to steal resources. So yeah. you're, you're quite, and you've got a lake, so you're quite vulnerable as Tagawa, which, you know, you got to make the most of those traps. And Crimea has um, two spaces to think about. They've got a lake next to them. You got to worry about Polania. Yeah. But the other place, Crimea is one of the only factions, if not the only faction that only has one exit point, And that is that oil tunnel. So, I mean, you have Wayfair, but if you're Wayfaring to get out of your base, you're in trouble Yeah, um, because central board control is so important. Yeah. So you've got to be cognizant of that oil tunnel. Um, try to anticipate if someone's going to block it. That's a great strategy to slow Crimea down is block that oil tunnel, which is why you'll often see Crimea players build a mine on that mountain to get out. Wow. Um, so just kind of that would be my rundown of kind of the spaces on the board that each faction wants to think about when planning their strategy or anticipating what other factions are going to do. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And then with the encounters as well, how would you, what, what thoughts do you have on those? Yeah. Encounters are really strong early game. Uh, so for example, if I have two workers and I produce, I can get two resources or I can spend the coin trading and get two resources. If I hit an encounter that gives me, five resources for three popularity that's like two and a half turns right there yeah i mean that's that's huge yeah uh, but if i've already got all my deploys and all my enlists and i'm just hunting for combats i mean what are resources going to give me off an encounter not much i mean mm -hmm. four resources for two dollars in tier one's a wash and re resources can get stolen where coins can't yeah. so don't overvalue encounters in the mid to late game unless you're the exception to that is you're either Polania with Meander, so you're using a factory card with a bottom row action and hoping to get the second bottom row action off the encounter, or you're, say, Nordic with a bad economy mat and using a factory card and just praying that those encounters give you what you need. So don't go, if you have your bottom row actions, don't go after those encounters late game unless you need that one popularity or it's just gravy, you're moving and spreading out and you might as well grab an encounter. A lot of players spend the whole game hunting encounters. Don't do that aimlessly. There reaches a point where you think, what am I actually looking for these for in these encounters? The only thing that's actually of use to me in these encounters is power. 
is that really the best use of a turn? It's just yeah. hoping I get power. So don't, don't fall into the trap of hunting the hunting encounters after you already have everything you need. I see yes. players do it. It's trap. Yeah. So now the, the part that everyone loves about side, it certainly attracts, you know, if it's set up on a table, it's what gets people's attentions are the max. And so what do you see the, their most valuable role? How do you make the most of them and their abilities? And although each faction has different mechs with the different abilities, is there a general approach that you take to the build order? And, and how do you utilize yeah. them? Board? I know that's a, a big scope of the question, but. Um, sure. Well, what I could do is I could give um, one of the, a general, some general strategy for mechs and then um, kind of quickly go through the, what I consider my mech priority for the different factions. Um, the, the first thing I would say about mechs that I see people do sometimes is moving them by themselves. I call them naked mechs. They have no workers with them. There are some reasons to do that, but the people I see that do it successfully are pretty advanced players. You have specific reasons to do that. In general, if you're moving mechs and it's not the last turn of the game, keep workers with those mechs. And there's a couple of different reasons for that. One is you disincentivize other players to attack you because yeah. they would lose popularity, which yeah. either may knock them out of a higher tier, but even in a tier one strategy, if they lose all their popularity, they can't produce. So it's yeah. a disincentive to be attacked, whatever tier they're in. Um, but the reason you have those mechs is essentially to get combats and to spread workers. That's all they're there for. Yeah. So if yeah. you're not keeping workers with those mechs, what's the point of that mech? Yeah. To hold one space, you have eight yeah. workers. Workers are a lot better at holding spaces than mechs. Yeah. Eight workers versus four mechs in a character. So don't move your mechs willy nilly off the board without your workers. Keep workers with the mechs and drop the workers as you go. At the end of the game, spread those mechs out, drop the workers, get the mechs by themselves, turn in that objective and win. But during the game, keep those keep those workers with that those mechs until you've gotten full spread around the board essentially is what i would say um so that's that's what i'd say avoid naked mechs i i see it i see it a lot more than i feel like it should happen yeah. as far as build order for mechs um with rust viet it's usually river walk then speed then township then people's army and the reason for this is pretty quick uh river walk gets you to the farm which gives you enlists yeah um speed you're you're dead in the water without speed no matter yeah. who you are including ifa which tends to just invaders from afar to gawa and albion which tend to just be dead in the water yeah. um then township before people's army just because you need to be able to go to the factory if someone's about to end the game yes. um getting stuck in your bases rust at the last couple game um turns has cost me several games so i almost yeah. always go township instead of people's army unless i'm about to be attacked and people's army is the only way to deter it yeah. Um, moving around the board, I see Tagawa players usually go Ronin, then Shinobi, and then and Toka and versus Sweetan is um, situational, whether you're wanting to spread to lakes or you're wanting to invade other bases or maybe take Resviet's encounter if they're not in the game. For Crimea, they usually start with speed because they have metal and a farm without having to cross the river. Mm -hmm. Then you see river walk unless they have a mine. And then the second mech is often scout. Otherwise, Scout is usually the third mech, and Wayfair typically considered to be the weakest mech comes last. Saxony, sort of the, the starting two are always going to be speed and underpass, usually speed first, because it means your character can move to that encounter in one turn. Underpass helps you get out of your base. And then Disarm and Riverwalk, again, situational, depending on mm -hmm. whether, say, I want to control the center of the board and fight people who are already there, or I've got a really fast board like Industrial and I want to invade Nordic, I might go for Riverwalk. For Polania, the first two, just like Saxony has speed and underpass, Polania has speed and submerge. Mm -hmm. Most successful Polania strategies don't start with Riverwalk. There's some exceptions, but they're high level strategies yeah. and be very careful going yeah. that way. Then Riverwalk and camaraderie, again, do you want to invade somewhere? Riverwalk can help you spread out of your village a little easier. Um, camaraderie, if obviously you need to attack someone and you've picked up a lot of popularity off encounters. Albion, I usually see rally. Rally's almost always first, then shield because Albion's playing defense early because it starts with no combat cards and very low power. And then sword and burrow again are situational. Do you really want to move 
invade other bases, move off your village onto that oil tunnel, or are you looking to decrease other factions' power? And finally, Nordic, um, kind of like Polania has speed and submerge. Nordic has speed and seaworthy. Because mm -hmm. they have seaworthy, generally artillery is more useful than river walk, which usually comes last. So that's that's kind of that's my general mech priority for the different factions. So yeah. keep those workers with those mechs. And I would, at least when you're starting out, I would kind of go with those mech priorities. And then if you have a really good reason, deviate from them, but that's a good place to start. Yeah, great. And earlier you'd mentioned the, the power of the mechs to bluff combat. Could you maybe go into a little bit more detail on that? Yeah, you, you want to look for opportunities. So we talked about levying, say, attacks on another player, getting them to spend a certain amount to make them vulnerable. Uh, ironically, sometimes you can attack a player that has very high power. If, you talk, if, you're, um, if they're sitting at 13 power or with an upgraded bolster, you're thinking, well, next turn, they yeah. want to get that power star. So you yeah. attack them and suddenly <laughs> they've got a choice. Yeah. So maybe you can throw a four card um, and think, well, they're not going to give me a five. Maybe sometimes yeah. savvy players will, because they know this strategy, they're not going to throw a five. They're going to save their fives. And I don't think they're going to throw power because they want that power star. So I throw a four card, they throw a four or three or two card. And I was right. Yeah. I get a, a star against an opponent that had way more power than me. <laughs> um, you can send in, you can send in multiple units like we talked about and then throw one card. Yeah. Um, essentially, essentially bluffing. So as far as some specific numbers, four is a great number. If you think an opponent won't spend power and is going to hold their fives, um, six is, and seven are kind of those medium numbers. Once you start kind of getting clever, um, I even see people go eight to 10 when they're trying to wow. really guess what the other player is going to do, but, um, bluffing combat's a head game. Yes. And combat is a head game and guessing right is the difference between dominating a game inside and getting destroyed yeah and it's something that players i, I can kind of give you a few tips like this to help you get started but combat is something that has to be learned yeah and it has and you have to know your table you have to know who you're playing against and their habits or if you're online you need to judge their um you can look at their opening moves to kind of guess at their skill level and certain skill levels can be associated with certain combat habits. It's uh, it's one of the deepest and most challenging aspects of side is to figure out how to do combat. Yes. And I bet you there's a lot of beginners that feel it's more luck based than anything else. Many have said that Scythe can have a, a sudden and a somewhat anticlimactic ending. So how do you view the end game considering you don't know exactly when you're going to run out of moves and how do you know when to shift to that end game thinking? Well, here's what I'd say. I understand that's an easy impression to take away with the game of Psy. But as you play more and you get better at the game, I think you will come to agree with me that if an ending surprised you, it's your fault. Mm. Because Scythe is not a game of perfect information. It's a game of near perfect information, though. You can see everyone's map. You can see everyone's pieces. The only hidden information is combat cards. You can even see their power. Combat cards and objectives um, are, are the only hidden information. So it's a game of near perfect information. So what do we do? We assume the other player can get their objective and we assume they have good combat cards unless based on previous behavior, we really think they don't. And we look and say, I know everything else about what they have. I can kind of look sideways and count the coins sitting on that mat while they're taking their turn, not on my turn. You don't, you don't count up points on your own turn, right? Yeah. That's in the rule book. You can, but you can count points on other people's turn. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you can look and say, oh, wow, they have their deploys and their enlists and their mechs. Do they have combat opportunities on the board? Are there players they can reach that they can win combats against? I'm going to assume they can get that objective. Can they end next turn? If they can, what is my point maximizing play? Yeah. Um, I've seen countless 
incredibly dramatic finishes inside yeah Yeah. uh, where a player attacks another player and throws zero to send that player to six stars um, (laughs) so that they win the game not the other player i've seen a player attack the factory and attack another spot against say saxony win the factory and then lose on the other spot to send saxony to six stars oh Um, wow perfect timing <laughs> leveraging the leveraging the factory to put them over the top and then yeah. force the other player to win to win uh to end the game so they can win the game scythe has a lot of dramatic ways to end the game yeah. if you're if you feel like the game's ending anti climactic other thing to look for is multiple star turns that don't end in, with combats and objectives you can get this sometimes if a top row action like produce gives you the worker star and the bottom row action gives you a star like enlist or deploy or if, for instance, you're at 15 power and somebody um, produces into an upgrade, gets the worker star, gets the upgrade star, and gets that, well, you wouldn't get the last power because you have to spend the power to produce. But you know what I'm saying? Yes. You can get you can get multiple stars through a top row action, a bottom row action, and even yeah. maybe an enlist bonus. But if that happens, you could have anticipated it because yes. Scythe is a game of near-perfect information. So be aware of what combos the other players have. Don't just focus on what you're doing, but focus on what they are doing. Um, keep an eye out for behavior that they are doing that looks like they might have a certain objective. The more you play, the more you'll learn them and can, can look out for that sort of things. And just be on the lookout for multiple star turns. Once someone hits three stars, there are a lot of ways, if, you, if they're the right stars, to finish. Three star turns are common. Yeah. Four star turns are rare, but they happen. But you've got to you've got to be on the lookout for three star turns, or the game uh, ending can su- will surprise you. Yes, that's great. Okay, no, that's a good that's a good in, uh, indication of when you might want to shift your thinking and and start really counting up those points per move. And yeah, <laughs> lots of opportunities for analysis paralysis. That's for sure. <laughs> Time to spread out and get second, right? Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, just one last question, just as a general um, catch-all, you know, are there any other strategic uh, considerations that you feel are key to winning a game of Scythe? Any other insights that you feel uh, our viewers yeah. might, might benefit from, you know, just a sort of random uh, catch-all kind of question? Yeah, nothing, nothing particularly profound. I would just say, play the game. Um, there are 47 different legal combinations, right? And each one plays a little differently. Yeah. So that means you're going to play the game 47 times before you've played every combination. Wow. But once you've played every combination, the game's not over. The game's just getting started. Yes. And that's the exciting part because then you get to sit down and you get to say, okay, I played this and it didn't go well. What's a good strategy for this? And you get to play around, whether it's in a simulation or with a board in front of you and come up with a set of moves that you like. Some players say, I hate having scripted moves, but what we talked about earlier is you need to start with a script inside and then be able to pivot, then be able to improvise. And if you want to get good at the game, learn to love optimizing because that's, that's the beauty of Scythe. The beauty of Scythe, the artwork is beautiful, but the true beauty of Scythe is the way the resources, the turns, the, the movements, the way it all works together to be functionally a strategic orchestra. And yeah. once you've composed a nice piece of music, don't be afraid to play it. And, you know, maybe it turns into jazz halfway through. Yeah. But <laughs> yes. don't be afraid of writing down strategies and reusing strategies as a starting place. And the, the last thing I would leave your viewers with is just to have fun. Uh, yeah. Scythe is a game that you can you can sink a lot of enjoyable time into. And as long as you're enjoying it, there's the opportunity to get better. Don't get burned out, just have fun. And ultimately play the game the way you like it, the way that succeeds at your table and play it in such a way to get out of it what you want to get out of it. That's Mm -hmm. not the same thing for everyone. Some people it's it's, uh, winning and optimizing strategies. And for some people it's painting mechs and that's fine, but ultimately have fun. Yes. Well, that's, uh, that's great. There's so many valuable insights. I know that uh, our viewers are going to, they're going to be watching this again and again, taking notes, you know, because there's so, so many great ideas. And uh, I do, if you, if you want to share a little bit about uh, your, your YouTube channel, which is uh, a Scythe focused uh, channel and, and uh, 
talk about anything specific that you feel you'd like to promote or, or anything like that? For sure. My YouTube channel is uh, www.youtube.com slash letter C slash FOMOF. That's F-O-M-O-F. And I create scythe content and I'll just briefly share the way I do it. I, I live stream, play online, and I cut it down into individual games and share those games. Uh, I, I hope that players who watch those games enjoy it from an entertainment aspect, but also take a, away um, specific strategies as well as a feel for how one can successfully optimize and make mid to late game decisions that, that aren't scripted. And I'll also record and create tutorials. We did a, uh, we did a live stream the other day, um, me and another player of a Saxony tutorial I mentioned earlier. And the tutorial was live streamed so we could take questions from people and answer them. But the, uh, I just, I just released the first part of the tutorial today, in fact, for the people who couldn't catch the live stream. So I, I like, I love it when people tune in for the live stream, but I also uh, make sure to, to post the gameplay and post those tutorials and strategy vid videos as well for people who don't have a chance to tune into them live. So uh, I, I encourage people who enjoy my channel to plug in and join um, my discord as well as the, uh, sort of fan created main side discord it's a it's a great community whether you play online or not to come on and ask questions to get strategies and to really be part of a social element as well and i love it when my viewers um, not only come to the channel not only watch not only join the live stream but participate in the conversation and the community that is side so i hope some of your viewers have the chance to discover that and and enjoy it Yes, and I'm, I'm, I hope that they uh, they go over and check out your channel. I know after our conversation, I'm going to be checking out your channel uh, and your content because that just sounds fascinating. So, because um, as a as a oh, maybe I'm an intermediate type player of Scythe, um, it's so I'd, I'd love to see you uh, implement those strategies because it sounds like there's a lot of high level discussions, and I love that when when a game is that rich that it provides you with almost endless amount of time to discuss you know it's never quite solved there's just so much to always something new to talk about and that that just speaks to what a great game side uh is and i i, I appreciate you taking your time and uh boiling down all those was 3500 games you figure you've played um boiling that down into into uh uh, a nice uh, succinct uh summary of, of what to do and how to do it so really appreciate your time thanks for having me nato yeah